Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for January 2025. My name's Hayley and this month's highlights include the planets Venus and Saturn in Aquarius, Mars at opposition, the Quadrantids meteor shower and the Clavius crater on the moon. Taking a look at the bright planets, you can see that at the beginning of the month, just after sunset, so we're looking at around half past five here, we can see Venus, Saturn, Jupiter and Mars all shining brightly when we look towards the south. Mars reaches opposition this month on the 16th of January, which means that now is a great time to observe it since planets appear to be larger and brighter when they are at opposition compared to other times. If we move to a later part of the night, let Mars get nice and high. So here we are just after half past one in the morning. You can see Mars over here between Gemini and Cancer. If you take a look at it with a small telescope, so with your naked eye, you should be able to notice its orangey red color. And if you take a look at it with a small telescope, you might notice the light and dark features on its surface and its polar caps. If we move away from Mars, and move around to Jupiter in Taurus. So Jupiter was at opposition last month and is still very well placed for observing during this month. And Jupiter with a small telescope, you should be able to see its four large Galilean moons, its north and south equatorial cloud belts. And if you have a large enough telescope in good conditions, you might also be able to spot the great red spot the storm that is raging on Jupiter. The highlights for the planets this month, I think, are Saturn and Venus in the constellation of Aquarius. So I'm just going to go back to an earlier part of the night for us to be able to take a look at those. You can see them here shining brightly in the constellation of Aquarius and I've chosen Aquarius as our constellation of the month for this month even though this isn't necessarily the best time of year to observe Aquarius with it being quite a faint constellation and with it having two planets visiting it at the moment it will help you to find the right part of the sky because these two should be very easy to spot. So the time to spot them is shortly after sunset, looking towards the south, southwest. And if we move onwards into the night, so we're around half past five now at the beginning of the month, you can see that Venus will set around half past seven, followed by Saturn around half past nine. If we see how that looks different by the time we get to the end of January. So you can see it's much brighter at half past five at the end of January, the nights are getting brighter again. And you can see that Venus is much higher than it was at the beginning of the month. And Saturn is now setting first around half past seven, followed by Venus at around half past eight. If we go back again to the beginning of the month and just look at how the separation of these two changes as the month goes on so they they're approaching each other at the beginning of the month and if we move through the first days of the month you can see that they're getting closer and closer and closer until they reach their closest approach on the 18th of January when they'll only be about two degrees um, separated from each other very it should be very easy to get them both into a binocular field of view together and it will be a really nice sight in, in binoculars, um, Saturn and Venus together. So you can watch them close in on each other through the first half of the month and then begin to separate during the second half of the month. As well as watching for Venus and Saturn closing in on each other during the first half of the month, you can also watch for the crescent moon joining them on the third so here we are on the night of the third not too long after sunset and you can see the crescent moon and planet venus fit nicely together into a binocular field of view also on the third is the quadrantids meteor shower if i just scroll around 
towards the north, you can see the radiant of the meteor shower over here, just um, past the handle of the Big Dipper, um, close to the constellations of Hercules and Boötes. And if you want to catch some quadrantids, then you can go out at any part of the night and you can look in any direction um, and hopefully you will see some meteors. Allow your eyes to adapt for 20 minutes to the dark first. Make sure you're wrapped up nice and warm and stay out for as late as you can. If I move time onwards, you can see that the radiant of the meteor shower doesn't really get very high until we reach the early hours of the morning. So you'll have a slightly better chance of seeing meteors as the night goes on and you get into those um, morning hours. If we go to the evening of the 4th now, just after sunset. So on the th evening of the 3rd, we have the crescent moon making a close visit to Venus and the peak of the quadrantids meteor shower and then on the evening of the fourth the moon has moved across and is now making a close approach to saturn so close in fact that it appears to occult saturn so saturn seems to pass behind the moon which is a fairly unusual event and if you head outside around five o'clock find the crescent moon and saturn you could do observe this with your naked eye or a pair of binoculars or a small telescope um, i'm going to put a binocular view on and then just keep watching the pair of them if you are in the center of the uk then saturn should appear to disappear behind the moon at around 18 minutes past five and that will vary by a few minutes depending on exactly where you are and then it's a case of waiting for Saturn to re-emerge again on the other side which should happen at around 25 past six again varying by a few minutes depending on exactly where you are in the country um, so that's a really interesting thing to look out for on January the 4th if we stay with these even still and go back to Venus again and just take a telescopic look at Venus you can see that it's showing just about showing a gibbous phase a little bit more than half full and if we just go through the days of early January on January the 12th Venus reaches what's known as dichotomy or 50% phase so it's showing exactly 50% um, of its disk to us and then following the 12th we move into Venus's crescent phase so you can watch that process happening as well in January if you have um, a run of clear days you can have a look how Venus's phase changes from gibbous to half full to a crescent phase the final thing for us to do in this part of the sky is to take a look at the constellation where all of this is taking place, which is the constellation of Aquarius. So I'm going to go back to an earlier part of the month. It's around half past five. And you can see Aquarius shining quite low to the horizon. And the, all of the stars in Aquarius, none of them look particularly bright. So it's not a very easy constellation to spot. The brightest star in the region is actually not in Aquarius. It's this one down here, Femmelholt. And that is part of Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish. And all of these constellations um, in this area are part of the Celestial Sea, the watery constellations that we've been focusing on over the last few months. We've talked about Cetus, the sea monster, and Pisces, the fish. And now we have Aquarius another constellation of the zodiac that is in the celestial sea if we put the art on you can see that it's depicted as a person with a cup of water uh, so aquarius meaning the cup bearer or the water bearer in latin um, and is depicted pouring water into the mouth of the southern fish you need to go out early at this time of the year to see it, um, which you'll be wanting to do anyway, so that you can catch Venus and Saturn before they set. Um, and the, the location of those two bright planets should hopefully help you to find Aquarius if you haven't managed to spot it before. 
Uh, in Greek mythology, Aquarius is so associated with a deluge that wiped out almost all of humanity. And Zeus, the king of the gods, unleashed the flood to punish people for their misdeeds in a story that parallels the story of the great flood in the Old Testament. In ancient Egypt, the constellation of Aquarius represented the god of the Nile River, uh, the bene benevolent god that distributed the waters of life and the urn symbolising uh, the fountain of good fortune. If you would like to try to find a deep sky object in Aquarius, a good one to look for is Messier 2 or M2, which is a globular cluster near to the head and shoulders of Aquarius. It would help to find it if you have a go-to telescope or tracking telescope um, and you can see over here we have m2 so a globular cluster is a large collection of stars bound together by gravity um, in these fantastic um, dense clusters if you can spot it with your naked eye it will just look like a star um, it's on the limit of naked eye visibility so you have to have really good eyes and good conditions to be able to find it with your naked eye it's about magnitude six um, if you have a pair of binoculars, then you, you should be able to make out that um, there's something there. And if you have a small telescope, you'll be able to tell that it's not a star, it's something else. And if you have a telescope that's a little bit bigger, maybe uh, four inches in diameter or larger, then you should be able to start to resolve individual stars within the globular cluster. Let's finish off by taking a look at the moon. So we'll get rid of our constellation art and... We've already said that the crescent moon pays a visit to Venus on the afternoon of the 3rd and to Saturn on the afternoon of the 4th, including an occ occultation of Saturn by the moon on the 4th. If we keep going, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and watch the moon as it heads over towards Taurus. And when we get to the 9th, it is quite close to the Pleiades, uh, Seven Sisters Open Star Cluster. And I'm just going to centre on the moon and we can just watch as the moon actually passes over the Pleiades in the early hours of the morning on the 10th and then continues its journey um, towards Jupiter. And now we're getting to the point where Taurus is setting. So if you are trying to catch... Um, the moon pass passing over the, the Pleiades star cluster, then do be aware that Taurus will be quite low by that point. So you want to make sure you've got a nice clear horizon. So I'm just going to go back to a point in the night where everything's nice and high. And we can continue to follow the moon. So it's passing by Jupiter on the 10th. And then heading towards Gemini and Mars on the 13th and 14th of January just before Mars reaches its opposition on the 16th we might be able to fit the Mars and that's uh, so Mars and the moon into our binoculars and also on the 13th we have the full moon so our full moon for January, known as the wolf moon, occurs on the 13th. So you've got an opportunity here to see a very bright planet Mars and a very bright moon close to each other in the night sky on the 13th. If we take a closer look at our full moon, we've been having a look over the last few months at some of the prominent features on the moon, first focusing on some of the lunar seas and then more recently looking at uh, the Ke uh, Kepler and Copernicus ray craters. And I want to have another a look at another prominent crater on the moon this month, which is the Clavius crater, um, which is located in the southern part of the moon, quite near to the famous crater Tycho. Um, and I'm going to move across to my other software to take a closer look at that. So here we are in Lunar Quick Map, taking a look at the moon on the night of the 13th, morning of the 14th, when the moon is full. We can see we've got the Kepler and Copernicus ray craters over here that we talked about last month. And we've got the Tycho crater down here. And I've marked Clavius for us just so that we can see easily where it is in relation to everything else. 
It's named after the German astronomer and mathematician Christopher Clavius, and it's one of the largest craters on the moon at over 200 kilometres in diameter. And you should be able to view it with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, or maybe even your naked eye when it is close to the Terminator. So we zoom in to get a better look at it. Um, you might also be familiar with it if you are a science fiction fan because it's also the home of the lunar base in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. And you can see that it's an interesting crater because there's a lot going on. It's got lots of smaller craterlets inside the crater. It's got these two um, fairly large craters that appear to break into the wall of the crater. So this one up here, which is Porter this one and Rutherford down here and it's quite interesting to compare these two because Rutherford has a much more raggedy um, kind of rough crater floor than Porter which looks much smoother. Um, if you would like an extra challenge this month once you have identified the Clavius crater and perhaps explored it with your telescope had a look to see if you can find these um, Porter and Rutherford craters that interrupt the walls some of these smaller craters that um, are on the floor of the Clavius crater you could have a go at spotting the Clair Obscura effect which is known as the eyes of Clavius um, and these effects are transient features on the moon that are caused by the interplay of light and shadow that happens um, when a feature on the moon is close to the terminator so you need to look at it just at the right time in order to see these effects. Um, the eyes of Clavius happens when the moon is around eight and a half days past new which in January will be on the 7th um, around midnight so the night of the 7th going into the morning of the 8th around midnight so I'm just going to change our time to around midnight on the night of the 7th okay so I'm just going to zoom out a second so you can see the position of the terminator if I zoom back in the eyes of Clavius um, what happens, it doesn't show it brilliantly on this, but you can head out on the evening of the 7th into the morning of the 8th and see if you can spot this for yourself. And what happens is the floor of the crater will be in shadow, but the rims of these two craters, Clavius C and Clavius D, these two little craters inside Clavius, are lit uh, and they look like a pair of spooky eyes staring back at you out of the crater. Um, so that is the Clair Obscure effect known as the Eyes of Clavius. Um, so if you'd like an extra challenge this month, you can head out on the 7th and see if you can spot that. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for January. And I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.